I'm delighted to see so many friends and neighbors and also others who have struggled with this weather to inform themselves or inform us, I hope. My assignment was really quite specific. It was to uh, go through some bits of history that are very relevant, we may have forgotten, or need to be reminded of, to run through some of the issues in the in this rather tragic story of the Iraq war and to run through finally some of the strategic options that have been proposed, talked about, argued about. Now you're familiar with a lot of them, I know. I normally don't like to read. I like to take my glasses off and keep them off. <coughs> to save time, um, Let's start. The problem that everyone seems to be grappling with on this subject all over America, probably all over Iraq, <coughs> is how to end this war, not to how to win it, but how to end it without abandoning the Iraqis to a fate that we would be morally responsible for. That's quite a dilemma. The president has now proposed a what some call an escalation, others call a surge, 17,000 more American troops in Baghdad, 4,000 more in Anbar province, where Al-Qaeda, by the way, seems to be most active. The question we can't answer here is, will it work? <clears throat> but that lurks behind everything we say and argue about. The American public seems to be very tired of this war, discouraged. <clears throat> One has seen this before, even back in the Korean War, where it was Truman's War. Eisenhower won the election, saying, I will elected, I will go to Korea. The Vietnam War, which everyone in this room must remember. And here we are again. It's not Vietnam. I argued that in a column in the, in the Christian Science Monitor a couple of weeks ago. But it's something else equally poignant and neuralgic. The Congress is split badly. In other words, the country is uncertain, uh, unwilling to be dragged further unless they can be shown that this is going to accomplish ends that they support. So let me run through briefly, a few bits of history. I'm not saying that <clears throat> you've forgotten them, but uh, you might have. Well, you, it's helpful to relate them to what we're, what we're doing now. I think it was Cicero who said, not to know what has gone before is to be as a child. Well, a lot of us would rather be children at some point. But I'd like to try and shed some light on this kaleidoscopic, panoramic sort of picture and provide some facts. <clears throat> now, one of my favorite sayings was by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but not our own facts. <laughs> and I'm going to pretend that my facts are the real ones, and I hope you'll go along with them. I'm going to try to describe the situation in this fashion. That, too, can be dangerous. This is a story of a, <clears throat> a man who was shot, was lying in a pool of blood, and the policeman bent over and asked him if he could describe his assailant. And he said, that's what I was doing when he shot me. <laughs> let's, let's see what happens here. 